Why would a man need a barn to store all the stuff you can't bring home? About 30 years ago, back when I was young and interested in farming, I carried all kinds of junk home. After a day in the field, I'd come home with buckets, shovels, dirty boots and clothes, and instantly transform the living room. But even back then, there's something I always kept in the barn. I stopped keeping my pills inside the house because every time I was about to take a triple, someone would knock on my bedroom door. Now they're knocking on my barn door. Well, fine. It's not every day that someone comes to visit your barn. In all the years we worked together, Kendrick never came to visit the house. We drank at bars, went fishing, went to the mountains, even chased off some poachers one time. But he never came for dinner with the family. We never watched football over here. And now he's brought his friends to visit my barn. I always try to look unsurprised, like it's an everyday thing to get visitors at the old barn, especially guests with their own personal bodyguards. But Kendrick is sharp enough to see he's caught me with my pants on backwards. Sorry for the surprise, Jack. We saw you from the car, figured we'd find you in here. I'm going in for a minute, fellas. These guys will wait outside. How long you been dating the lover boys? They're sans people, Jack. Yeah. So now you're appearing in public with members of the Mafia? Jack, I'm leaving tonight. More like fleeing. Jenny and I are taking the girls and making a run for it. Probably won't be seeing each other again. I've got new documents, a new name, a new life, everything new. The papers say you're still working your last week for the department. I've got to get out today. I won't be getting another chance. Don't know if you noticed, but the whole city is against me. You told your Mafia friends about your plans. Jack, if I don't fix everything with them in the next few hours, they're going to kill me. And not just me. My family, my relatives, God, Jack, I don't know who else. They found out that I was planning to run, and they demanded that we close our contract today. Your contract, Frank? Really? Is that how you talk now? Maybe you should call in the lawyers to straighten all this out. Now is not the time, Jack, please. I have a commitment to them until the end of the year. They need an inside line at police headquarters. I can't just give them back the money. That's not how the Mafia works. If I can't find someone I can trust tonight, I'm dead. You know me, Jack. I wouldn't ask you if I wasn't afraid they'd cut my daughters to pieces before sunrise. He's the damn fool who puts his daughters in the crosshairs in the first place. Anyone in my place would have dressed him down good. But I didn't want to pile it on. Fate's already got this guy's soul in the grinder. Give him my phone number and tell him it's done. Don't call me. Don't come to work today. I don't want to see or hear from you again. Time for you to go. Jack, I... Get the fuck out of my nice cozy barn, Frank. At the time, I was trying not to think about what just happened. It was almost too much to take in. I'm probably the most popular police chief in the history of the city, and I have to admit, I've thought about that more than once, sometimes with a little pride even. In one of the features they wrote about me in the papers, they said it pretty plain. He catches the criminals. Believe me, high praise like that is unheard of in Freeburg, especially for a cop. And here I am, the person who catches criminals and I've agreed to help the Mafia 
or I'll come home to a bag stuffed with my kids' body parts. Right before the last hammer falls. Hey, remember that cop who caught criminals? It turns out he was a mafia bitch. And all for the sake of a greedy, corrupt cop who should have fled the country years ago. That sound right to you?
Mr. Boyd, there was a man here earlier. He left you this. A man? What man? Who let him on this floor? I don't know. I've never seen him before. I asked him his name, but he just ignored me. He was talking on a big telephone, you know, one of those portables. He gave me this envelope and left. Damn. Okay, let's see about this. Of course, they could have shot them the second they took the photo, but I knew Kendrick and his family were all right. Either way, the message was not that they got out. It meant that I was in. My servitude to the Mafia had begun. I'd only been in my new position five seconds, and I already knew why Kendrick called it a contract. You sound doomed if you call it what it is. A curse. Boyd. Good morning, Jack. I believe you just received my message. Who am I speaking with? Oh, I'm sorry. I forget some people don't recognize my voice. But I assure you, Jack, if I was sitting right there in front of you, you'd have no trouble recognizing me. Like I was a member of your family. Even better than a wife, perhaps. A wife can betray you. No man is immune. I don't talk to people who don't tell me their names. Oh, Jack, don't be so childish. You're too old to run away from strangers. Yes, we both are. And in our old age, friendship becomes rare and all the more precious. But of course, 
We must work with new people and find out new names. So if you insist, Jack, let us formally meet. Hello, Jack Boyd. I'm Christopher Sand. Wonderful, Mr. Sand. And what is it you do for a living? Oh, you'll soon find out all about that. Well, you'll learn much more than a simple policeman could ever expect. You're a simple policeman no longer, Jack. Don't turn off your phone. You start today. Eight in ten. It's been my go-to principle since my first day on the job. I've got to let my colleagues hush up what they need to, two out of ten times, so that they'll help me with the remaining eight. Eighty out of a hundred, eight hundred out of a thousand, I'm proud of those statistics. It's not so bad for Freeburg, right? But now I just officially became a mafia whore. I'm supposed to be fearing for my life, for the lives of my wife and children. But the only thing I can think, what's going to happen to 8 and 10?
Officer on scene, it looks like we have a situation here.
The people of Freiburg have built up a tolerance for the petty horrors of modern life. You'll never see crowds gathering around a beaten passerby. Folks rarely even slow to gawk at a car accident. And street theft doesn't turn heads anymore. Been a long time since people got worked up about stuff like that. So when I ran into a troubled crowd on the way to work, I knew there was something serious going on. Something bad enough to knock these people out of their daily rhythm. And we're talking about people who would step over a corpse if it was blocking the door to the coffee shop. But apparently all it takes is a bunch of leaflets, or spreading broken glass across Main Street, or releasing a couple of hundred rats in the ice arena. The mysterious figure taking responsibility for these strange acts goes by the alias Robespierre. Nobody knows who he is, what he wants, or what all this adds up to from the buckets of lard spread on the sidewalk to the front door of City Hall covered with ostrich feathers. But this strange cross between childhood pranks and cheap theatrics has got the people all worked up. Everyone understands when some Freeburg crook satisfies the basic human need to rob and kill. But when someone steals a lion from the local zoo and locks him in a cell below the courthouse, the people start asking questions. Myself, I kind of like this Robespierre. It's not just the pranks he's pulling or his green bull's head emblem. I just like his funny nickname. Robespierre? Really? Who does that make me? The Marquis de Lantanac? I don't think so. In the old books about revolutions, I fancy myself the old gunner who goes off to war with a bag of damp powder. Or maybe the innkeeper who tops up the beer kegs with mop water. Hmm. It's something to think about. Nine eleven in progress. Ten A in progress. We've got 
9-11 in progress. I don't love it. 